Good morning. It is a real pleasure to have you all here today. Thank you so much for um, making it here, coming and joining us for these absolutely um, fantastic opportunities of discussing the managing exit from armed conflict project. I am absolutely thrilled to be sitting between two wonderful ladies. Of course, you all know Dr. O'Neill, who's been really spearheading and, and, and leading wonderfully this project. And um, certainly um, a big, uh, big thank you to you. But I, I'm also absolutely thrilled to be sitting with UN University because we are together, in fact. Um, I have been working very closely over the last year as the MIAC project, as you know, transitioned from UNU, which was really its mothership and the place where it was launched and, and, um, and grew, to UNIDIR, the UN Institute on Disarmament Research. Um, at UNIDIR, we were absolutely convinced from the beginning that uh, MIAC was a right project for UNIDIR and that we would be the right place for, for MIAC. The links between um, all of what the MIAC project has been doing and the issues of disarmament and arms control the management of weapons and ammunition, the whole cyclical nature of, of working on reintegration um, were very obvious to us from the beginning. But there are a few characteristics of the MIAC project that I would like to underline now very briefly before giving you the floor, which um, also made it absolutely clear to us that we were keen to have this project. And that's the very deep collaborative nature of this research project. This is about collaboration, collaboration with local researchers, collaboration with different UN entities and other entities. It's very collaborative and it's, it's extremely important in its very nature and the processes in which the research is, is being carried out. A second characteristic is the fact that it is grounded, grounded in the reality of the location where the research is being done. It's very localized, working with and through local researchers, and thank you very much, uh, researchers that are, that are all here, and thank you for, for coming, and thank you for all your excellent work. It's really grounded in, in these realities. And it is also um, something that is very much about an uptake. Um, it's about making sure that these research projects are not detached from reality, but are able to influence and change sometimes and modify and, and ensure that programming is adjusted to the reality on the ground. So the grounded really goes with the uptake, but the uptake, the being able to influence policymakers, um, decision makers is absolutely key. So thank you to all um, those of you here representing different UN entities and partners, including also member states that are so crucial in, um, in our project and in really doing that uptake. Thank you so much for, for being here. With this, I'd like to just say one word, and it's a word of, of thanks to you and you for the great collaboration in handing over this project, but especially to Dr. O'Neill and the whole team. I mean, you know who you are. I'm not going to list um, the, the, the team here, but thank you so, so much for making that transition and for delivering fantastic results. So looking forward to a day of ex two days of exchange and really the capacity for us all to interrogate what has been done learn from it, and even adjust to even do better. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's wonderful to see all of you. I see a lot of faces that I've known for many years from various places in the field and other collaborations. So thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Erica Gaston. I'm from the UNU Center for Policy Research. And MIAC started with UNU CPR in 2018. Um, as Cecile mentioned, we've been happy to uh, be part of supporting it as it transitions over to UNIDIR, but continue to collaborate closely. And that's partly because the issues that MIAC are, is raising are absolutely crucial still to the work that we do you, to work that all of you do, and to the overall goals of the UN system. My role within UNUCPR is as the head of the Pillar on Conflict Prevention and Sustaining Peace. And the issues we're discussing today, not only the sort of downstream consequences or how you manage issues of fighters making the transition, moving to civilian life, but also how does that connect to the larger issues? How does it connect to issues of state governance? How does it connect to issues of whether they're addressing basic needs for security or future challenges like climate change? All of these are absolutely crucial. 
even more, I want to underline what we're all doing here at this workshop, which is actually like a pretty rare space and a really important achievement within the research field. I spend a lot of my time arguing for exactly what MIAC is doing, which is longitudinal studies, cross-comparison analysis, actually taking the time to understand how are the tools that we keep deploying in country after country, how are they actually working? How could they be improved? How could they be tailored to the new challenges that are coming up? And so I also just want to applaud what we're doing today, which is actually taking time out to sit down and really unpack this treasure trove of data that they have and bringing together people from, I see friends from academia, I see friends uh, coming in from the field in Iraq, I see friends coming over from different UN institutions, from member states. And I think bringing all of those different perspectives, that different energy is going to be really crucial. So I want to think about this not just as a, you know, a typical workshop where we're having presentations, but I think this really is a space for collaboration and where we can come up with stuff out of it. So thank you all for joining me, and I'm really excited to participate over the next two days. Well, thank you both. Thank you both for um, helping support and build and promote this project. So thank you to both institutions. Um, thank you all for coming today. It's a really great group in this room, so I'm really excited. Some of you were with us yesterday for our high-level opening, which was a lovely start. But today, the right word was unpack. Now we're really going to start to unpack some of those findings and delve into them more. I'm going to take a few house keeping moments, and then I'll give you a brief run through of uh, the project and also how today will run. Apologies for those of you who were yesterday. There'll be a little bit of repetition here and there, but I promise you over uh, 10 panels over two days, there'll be a lot of new stuff that we can really dig into. So just on the completely sort of logistical front, most important, there's coffee over there. Coffee, water, drinks are there. Uh, toilets are on either side of the coffee break. Um, we also have a coat check, so if you want to put anything in the coat check, feel free. We have a prayer room in that back corner if you'd like to step out. And we have other facilities uh, for um, mums who might need them. And I'm very proud. This was something I really have tried for a while. We have two babies in attendance today, which is a real breakthrough, and I'm super excited about it. And it's extremely relevant, I'll tell you, in the field. Because when we do focus groups, we have to provide care to make sure that mothers will come. Um, and I think when we have conferences, we need to make sure we can accommodate so we get the right people in the room. And we did today. So I'm really excited about that. Um, OK, so that's on the facilities. How today will run. We do have panels today, but we've kept them pretty short. And we've asked speakers to pack in a lot of information in a very short presentation. We will most of the time, not always, most of the time have a member state give us a bit of framing, introduce sort of the topic or the challenge, and then we'll have individuals who've worked with the MIAC project present MIAC research, present research, other research that they've done, and other partners present some of the empirical evidence from their work as well. We will then have a discussant help us kind of interpret that through the lens of well, what does this mean for policy and practice, and then we will stop. But don't worry, we will get a chance to actually discuss. So we'll do these first panels, one and two, back to back. We'll have a coffee break. And then we will split into two groups. And we really have put the bulk of our time over the next two days in these workshop sessions. And that's where we start to unpack all of these issues. And we have some great facilitators in the room who are going to help us out. Um, and sometimes it will just be a discussion, very informal, and you can choose which one you'd like to attend. So this morning we have panel one, we have panel two back to back, and then in the two rooms in the corner, you can choose which workshop session you'd like to go to. Some of these will be tailored to trying to influence a process or, or actually have an output uh, associated with them. So maybe I'll just give you one example. So panel two, which is on children and youth involved in armed groups, we're actually going to try to create a sketch of a research agenda um, on children involvement to inform prevention and reintegration, and particularly reintegration, because we are going to hand this over um, as a document to the Joint Global Program on CAFAG reintegration for them to take forward. And so there are opportunities where we try to plug in um, or to an uh, upcoming series of conferences in the Lake Chad Basin to make sure that we can support uh, practitioners on the ground and some of the actual work that's being done. Um, what else to say about that? For those of you who are coming up 
on one of the panels. Again, yesterday was our high level. We were a bit formal today. This is really relaxed because we want to make sure we're having those, uh, those discussions that we need to have. So the panelists will sit here. Any panelist who may want to present from the podium can. You're welcome to sit here as well. We have a clicker for you. All right, using the clicker. We have the bios of participants, we have some MEAC publications, and we have the workshop agenda. We're trying to be more green, so just scan one of these if you need any of that information. And there's points around the facility uh, where you can scan in other places as well. So a couple housekeeping rules. So we have listed you all by your affiliation, but the assumption is, unless you say otherwise, that you are speaking in your personal capacity. We know that you are informed by your institution and all of the work that you have done, but please don't feel as though you have to provide uh, the talking points for your institution. We really want to get beyond that quickly. The panels will be recorded and we will potentially put them online at a later date, but the discussions will be Chatham House rules and there will be no recording. So just so everyone knows um, what Chatham House rules mean, it means you can't attribute uh, any statements to an individual or their institution. You can talk about what happened in the meeting, you can talk about the content of those conversations, but please don't attribute them to anyone. Um, obviously, we're working to have a, a respectful conversation, but we really do want to, to really provoke and to make sure that we are moving beyond kind of our uh, staid debates sometimes and really sort of unpack what's possible. And we're also going to try to move beyond acronyms. So we want to get to the nitty gritty, particularly of interventions. So we don't want to be up here at DDR and SPRR and we want to be down here. You know, if we are providing psychosocial support, what is the impact for a particular population? We want to be that fine-grained. And I think that's also important when we talk about terminology. There's certainly a lot of terminology in this space that's disputed, or at least we're just using different definitions. So if we could get beyond that pretty quickly, so things like violent extremism, what exactly are you talking about? Just so we can all make sure that we're on the same page and we're having the same discussion and we're not having five discussions under one umbrella, uh, one umbrella term. Uh, let's see. Yes, I think that's all sort of general conference management sort of stuff that we're all used to, but we're going to try to manage the time. I've already blown it because we've gone over, um, but we'll try to make sure that we move fairly quickly and protect that space that we have to really have the discussions. So now I'm going to take just a few minutes to give you an intro to the project. Um, for those of you who may not be as familiar to it, so we're really lucky to have a lot of our partners and donors in the room today. So I want to thank all of you for your continued support and engagement on this project. And you can see it's a big constellation and that constellation is getting bigger. Um, so that's really exciting for us to make sure we have all of these great partners. So we're learning from them, we're responding to their needs, and we're really trying to make sure our work has uptake. So just generally for those of you who don't know, the managing exits from arm the Managing Exits from Armed Conflict Project, MIAC for short, um, is really trying to enhance our understanding of how and why individuals leave armed groups and sustainably and fully reintegrate into civilian life. We have worked to create an agreed framework across all of these interventions, build assessment tools. We've been piloting them for three years in the countries you see on the map. And now we're really mining that data and trying to present the analysis to practitioners so they can use it to adjust their programming in semi-real time. Who do we study? We are interested in people coming out of all types of armed groups. So not only rebel groups, insurgent groups, listed and sanctioned groups, but also community militias um, who have risen up to defend their communities as well. We're interested in people who joined willingly, people who fought, but also people who played support roles, people who were um, sort of uh, vaguely involved or along some sort of continuum of engagement or maybe irregular engagement. We're also interested, particularly in Iraq, uh, of people that were perceived as affiliated. So they themselves were not, but maybe a family member was, or their family has this stigma of involvement in some way. We are also interested in community members, those who have been impacted by armed groups, those that receive armed groups, those that people were recruited from, those communities as well. We are looking at men, women, 
boys and girls down to the age of 12, depending on the case study. And we are interested in the whole journey. So we think that if you really want to understand how someone can transition after being involved with an armed group, you really need to understand their whole journey. What was their life like before they were involved? How and why were they recruited or how did they become engaged? What was like life like in the armed group? How and why did they leave? And what has life been like since? So we're interested in all kinds of interventions, some of which the UN supports, some of which the UN may not support. But we're interested in the impact of these various acronyms, but below, and what impact they have on someone's trajectory. So what do we measure? What, what equals a successful reintegration? We think about this as a continuum. So there are a series of indicators uh, that show someone is just not oriented to conflict. So do you think of yourself as a member? Um, do you still engage in, uh, uh, in fighting on behalf of a group or logistical activities? Do you just identify with the group? Or is your social network entirely made up of people who are still fighting? So some of those factors may help us sort of understand if someone is oriented to conflict or they've moved on. You don't have to be oriented to conflict to still be what we would probably consider a reintegration failure in the sense that um, you may not engage in conflict violence, but if you engage in criminal violence or interpersonal violence, that's not really what we'd call success. So we measure all kinds of other indicators to show if somebody has become part of the community again. Are they part of economic life? Can they support themselves? Do they have a social network? Um, do they engage in civic and political activities? You know, what is their physical and mental health like? Are they safe? Do they have access to services? And we ask these questions not only for people who've been in armed groups, but we ask them for unaffiliated community members as well. And by doing that, we, and by doing it for the period right before conflict began, and right before recruitment, we're able to isolate those factors that are different in those populations and those factors that are associated with a higher probability of becoming involved. So that really helps us, I think, for a, a project on exits, it really helps us speak to the issues of prevention and recruitment. Quickly on methodology, this is a multi-method uh, study in every country where we work. So we do qualitative work, focus groups, key informant interviews. We also do participatory work. We do experimental work. But the real value is long-term panel surveys following up with the same individuals over time to see how they're doing. And this is really a recognition that reintegration is a process. It's not an event. It doesn't happen in a day. It takes time. So we have to follow people over time. This is, a, this is one, one month of data collection last March that was very busy for us, you can see. So we're doing this in a lot of places with a lot of people. I mean, we've interviewed almost 20,000 people. We've registered 40,000 people to be able to be part of future surveys as well across our case studies. Um, this project went through Ethical uh, Review Board. Um, this is trying to balance both universal so we can speak across context, but also recognizes the hyper-local uh, contextualization that needs to happen everywhere we go. We try to be flexible. We have to be flexible because we work in conflict-affected places. We really try, and you've met, I think, some of our local researchers. We're really trying to promote existing research capacity and help build it where it doesn't exist as much so that we can have that enduring impact. Um, and I'll just say one of the examples of that, you'll see Mohammed, who's back there. Uh, this is him giving out a certificate at one of our professional enumerator trainings. So we now in Northeast Nigeria have what, is it close to 40 professional enumerators? Um, so we have a large standing team there that Mohammed and uh, Fatima have helped train uh, and others have gone and supported as well, but we're hoping that's an enduring impact beyond our project. And this is just a quick overview of the case studies thus far. So over the last three years, uh, we started in Nigeria and then expanded into Chad, Niger, and Cameroon. We've been in Iraq uh, doing a series of studies uh, with IOM and UNDP and now UNICEF. 
and then in Colombia, where we worked very closely with the ARN um, on the multiple streams of exit, reintegration, reincorporation, and now the d differential assistance process. And in the Lake Chad Basin, we're really excited because we've now registered a lot of the mass exits that everyone keeps talking about. So that's part of this next wave that's coming, um, and really a regional approach, which is somewhat unusual. So that's it for this very quick opening.